What is causing your leg and or foot numbness and tingling? Hello, this is Dr. Grant Cooper from Princeton Spine and Joint Center. It's been a little while since my last video. I got a lot of requests to make a video about leg and foot numbness and tingling. So that's what I'm gonna talk about now. In this video, I'm going to explain everything that you need to know about leg and foot numbness and tingling. Now first, a quick reminder to please press the little like button and please subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. Now first off, numbness and tingling are clear symptoms of nerve irritation. So if you're having these symptoms, then somewhere in your body, your nerves are upset. Now let's figure out where the nerves have gone wrong by exploring the more common patterns that they go wrong in. So if the numbness and or tingling symptoms are in both of your feet, especially if they're in a fairly symmetric pattern, then this may be a symptom of what we would call a peripheral neuropathy. Now, a peripheral neuropathy is another way of saying that there's a generalized problem with the nerves. Peripheral neuropathy symptoms often show up first in the toes and the feet because the nerves to these areas are the longest peripheral nerves in the body, and because they're the longest, they're also therefore the most vulnerable to, to injury. You could think of a peripheral neuropathy as similar to wear and tear of the nerves or, or wear and tear of any other structure in the body like the joints. That is to say that over time, sometimes the nerves just slow down and they don't fire as well as they used to. Now indeed, the most common cause of a peripheral neuropathy is what we would call idiopathic peripheral neuropathy. Idiopathic has a Latin derivation, but ultimately, Idiopathic just means that we have no idea what's causing it. So in an idiopathic peripheral neuropathy, the nerves slow down, and we can see the nerves are slowing down, but we don't know why they're slowing down. And about half of all peripheral neuropathies turn out to be idiopathic. Now the most common type of a peripheral neuropathy where we can diagnose with a clear cause, that is a peripheral neuropathy where we know why it's happening, and this is also the one that many people think of when they hear about a peripheral neuropathy, is a diabetic peripheral neuropathy. When somebody has uncontrolled or poorly controlled diabetes, then over time, and often over time means many years or even decades, the nerves can become affected and start to not work properly. And indeed, about half of people who are living with diabetes have some form of nerve damage. Now, there are many, many other causes of peripheral neuropathies, and these include things like low vitamin B12, thyroid problems, low folate infections like Lyme disease or HIV, certain types of cancer, chronic kidney disease, a history of chemotherapy, and a host of other potential problems. Books on peripheral neuropathies are very thick. They're like yay big, because there are lots of types of neuropathies, and there are lots of causes of all of those different types. But basically, for our purposes at the moment, if you have numbness and tingling in both feet, and if those symptoms are symmetric, and especially if those symptoms don't change regardless of what you're doing, for example, if the symptoms don't get particularly better or worse with sitting or with standing or with walking, if all of these things are true, then a peripheral neuropathy is very high on the differential diagnosis list. Now, if you have bilateral numbness and tingling in the feet that gets worse or better when you walk and gets better or worse when you sit, then a peripheral neuropathy would remain on the differential diagnosis list as a possible cause, but a spinal problem like spinal stenosis where the nerves are being impinged in the spine in different positions is much more likely since when, this, when you stand, for example, the symptoms might get worse, suggesting, they're being, suggesting that the nerves are being impinged at that time. And when you sit, the symptoms might get better, suggesting that with flexion, the pressure is taken off of the nerves in the spine. Now, if the symptoms are only in one leg, or if the symptoms follow one peripheral nerve's path in both legs, then a peripheral neuropathy is far less likely. If the symptoms are in the bottom of the foot, then this is in the distribution of the posterior tibial nerve. There are three common problems that lead to symptoms in the posterior tibial nerve. The most common is actually a pinched nerve in the back. If someone has an S1 radiculopathy, or inflammation around the S1 nerve root as it exits the spine, then this can cause pain, numbness, and or tingling radiating down the back of the leg and into the foot. 
But this same, this same problem can also skip the buttocks and the thigh and even skip the lower leg. And it can just present as numbness and tingling in the bottom of the foot. The next most common cause of symptoms in the bottom of the foot is irritation of the tibial division of the sciatic nerve as it passes through or around the piriformis muscle in the buttocks. Now, usually with sciatica, the pain will be in the buttock and radiate down the back of the leg to the foot. Sometimes, however, it will just present with numbness and tingling in the bottom of the foot. And finally, the posterior tibial nerve passes through the tarsal tunnel on the inside of the ankle and root to the bottom of the foot. And in tarsal tunnel syndrome, which is the most common peripheral nerve entrapment in the leg, the posterior tibial nerve is compressed and irritated at the level of the tarsal tunnel, and this can cause pain, numbness, and or tingling in the bottom of the foot. People with flat feet are much more prone to tarsal tun tunnel syndrome, in fact, an effective way to address tarsal tunnel syndrome for many people is simply with good orthotics in the footwear to help restore the arch to the foot. If the symptoms are in the top of the foot, then this is in the distribution of the peroneal nerve. When someone has numbness and tingling or pain in the top of the foot, then this is also usually due to one of three causes. The most common cause, once again, is in the spine. If someone has an L5 pinched nerve in the back, then this will often present with back pain and buttock pain and pain radiating down the leg and into the top of the foot. However, sometimes it will present with only numbness, tingling, and or pain in the top of the foot. Now the second most common cause of numbness and tingling in the top of the foot is once again, compression and irritation of the sciatic nerve as it passes through or around the piriformis muscle. The sciatic nerve has a peroneal division and a tibial division in it. If the tibial division is affected, as we saw, then the symptoms will occur in the bottom of the foot. If the peroneal division is affected, and it's the more common division of the, of the sciatic nerve to be affected because the, the peroneal division is, more, is in a more lateral position, then the symptoms will be in the top of the foot. And the third most common cause of numbness and tingling in the top of the foot is a compression of the peroneal nerve itself. The peroneal nerve passes around the fibular head beneath the knee at the top of the lower leg. As it does this, the peroneal nerve passes close to the surface of the leg and is therefore very vulnerable to compression and injury. So if I have any mixed martial artist viewers out there, then you'll know this part of the anatomy because in lower leg kicks, this is where they're trying to target the peroneal nerve, which is what shuts the leg down and gives the, gives the opponent a drop foot. Uh, this, is what, this is what happened to Henry Cejudo against Demetrius Johnson in the first round of their last title fight, uh, where, Henry, where uh, Henry Cejudo ended up with a temporary foot drop. But the more common reason that someone might have a compression of the peroneal nerve, if they aren't in a mixed martial artist fight, is if they had a cast for the lower leg that wasn't quite fit properly, and that then puts pressure on the nerve. Also, if someone's been lying down a lot and they happen to be putting pressure on the nerve by the position in which that they're lying down, then this is also a common cause for it as well. And this is something that doctors are, or at least should be, on the lookout for in the hospital when they have patients who are in bed for extended periods of time. Now, other risk factors would include wearing high boots, uh, also crossing your legs regularly, uh, this can also end up putting repeated pressure on the peroneal nerve, so you have to be aware of those things. Now, if you have back pain and also pain, numbness, and or tingling, tingling radiating into the leg, then this is most likely coming from your spine. If the symptoms reliably get better or worse with sitting, as opposed to standing, then as we mentioned before, this suggests that the nerves are being pinched and released depending on the spinal position, and this would then further argue strongly towards the idea that the problem is coming from the spine. Different spinal nerves have different predictable pathways into the lower body. So the S1 nerve root, for example, travels down the back of the leg into the bottom of the foot. The L5 nerve root travels down the buttock and into the outside of the thigh and the lower leg and then into the top of the foot and characteristically will go into the big toe. The L4 nerve root will generally be felt referring to the front of the thigh and to the inside of the lower leg and ankle. The L3 nerve root will typically be felt in the front and the inside of the thigh or groin and into the knee. 
the L1 and the L2 nerve roots will generally be experienced in the groin. But it's very important to note with numbness and tingling that's emanating from nerve roots, there's going to be significant individual variation of where any one person actually experiences their nerve root symptoms. But with that said, these nerve root distributions are very good rules of thumb. Now finally, there's something called piriformis syndrome in which the sciatic nerve is irritated as it passes by or through the piriformis muscle in the buttock. It's important to note that this is much, much less common than nerve impingements in the spine, but it definitely still can happen. With piriformis syndrome or you know sciatica, the symptoms typically follow the L5 and or S1 nerve roots as they pass from the buttock to the thigh, the lower leg and the foot. But as we touched on before, piriformis syndrome can present as symptoms anywhere along the course of the nerve. Now there's one, there's one more really important thing that we need to be sure to talk about. It's so important for us to go over because it gets overlooked so much. Now this thing we need to talk about is something called double crush syndrome. In double crush syndrome, there are basically two compressions of a nerve along the same nerve chain. So it's sort of like a river that's being partially blocked at two spots along the course of the river. And as a result, the water at the end of the river is going to be much slower. So for, for example, perhaps the S1 nerve is inflamed in the lower back. The S1 nerve branches off and it ultimately feeds the posterior tibial nerve that goes through the tarsal tunnel in the ankle and then enters the bottom of the foot. So in double crush syndrome, the S1 nerve may be inflamed and the patient may also have tarsal tunnel syndrome. So the nerve is getting impinged or hit at two distinct places. This is very important to identify because failing to identify both problems may lead to wrong or inadequate treatments. So an example here will illustrate the point well. Unfortunately, I have so many examples that I could be choosing from when talking about double crush syndrome because it's just overlooked so often. But in this one, I had a patient not too long ago. Uh, he'd been treated by a podiatrist for bottom of the foot pain and tingling for well over a year. He'd been given orthotics, physical therapy, injections, medications, um, and the symptoms would always get better, uh, but they never completely went away. Now, the treating podiatrist was sure that he had the right diagnosis and he wanted to operate on the patient. He wanted to surgically release the tarsal tunnel. The patient wanted a second opinion and so he ended up going to another podiatrist and that second podiatrist thought maybe there was something else that might be going on uh, and not just tarsal tunnel syndrome so he sent the patient over to me. I ordered an, electro, uh, an electrodiagnostic study, an EMG, and this showed mild tarsal tunnel syndrome and it also showed a moderate S1 radiculopathy which as you mentioned, is a pinched nerve in the back at the S1 level. So I got an MRI of his lumbar spine. It showed a big disc herniation at L5 S1 that was compressing the S1 nerve root. I did an epidural at the S1 nerve root level and the symptoms went away completely. Now, in this patient, it wasn't that he didn't have tarsal tunnel syndrome, he did, but he also had a pinched nerve in his back. And so if you only addressed one of those two things, he was never going to get completely better. If he had gone on for that tarsal tunnel surgery, it, it really wouldn't have helped because the tarsal tunnel, as it turned out, had already been adequately treated and the remaining symptoms were coming from the S1 pinched nerve. There's one more story that I'd like to relate and this is one that I tell all the young doctors whenever I'm lecturing to them or if they pass through the clinic and, and we're doing some teaching. So when I was uh, in training, I spent several months working at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. Uh, you may know Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, is a famous cancer hospital. And our department there was like sports medicine for people with cancer. So many of the patients that we saw had nerve symptoms and they had been diagnosed with a chemotherapy induced uh, neuropathy. And so those folks were then being sent to us for basically symptom management. Um, for chemotherapy induced neuropathies, uh, for patients with that, all you could really do is to treat the symptoms with medications or maybe supplements, but we didn't have a good way of treating the underlying pathology of the chemotherapy uh, induced injury to the nerves. But what we found in that department over and over was that patients with a chemotherapy induced neuropathy with symptoms in the hands, for example, sometimes they also had carpal tunnel syndrome. Now the carpal tunnel syndrome may have been, <clears throat> may have been mild, but when it was superimposed, on the chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, 
it ended up with significant symptoms for the patient. Now, we couldn't fix, as we mentioned, the chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, but we certainly could fix the carpal tunnel syndrome. And what we found was that once we had treated the carpal tunnel syndrome, the symptoms usually got much better, even if they didn't totally go away. So the important take-home point is that for, you know, so for so many of these patients, the doctors they had been seeing had stopped at the diagnosis of a chemotherapy-induced neuropathy because they just didn't, they, they, they hadn't thought to look for anything else. And there was indeed a chemotherapy-induced neuropathy for these patients. But if they also had a pinched nerve in their back, or if they also had carpal tunnel syndrome, or they also had tarsal tunnel syndrome, for example, or, or some other nerve issue that we could fix, then by fixing what we could fix, we could vastly improve the symptoms and the patient's quality of lives. But again, you have to think to look for those things and to not stop at that first diagnosis. And the same is true in, in someone with a pinched nerve in the back uh, who isn't getting better with normal care. At that point, if, if not before, right, if you have someone and they're not getting better as you think they should, you have to think to yourself, could there be something additional going on, such as another part of the nerve chain being pinched or irritated that might be confusing and frustrating the clinical picture? That is, you always have to consider the possibility that a nerve is being impinged at more than one spot. When someone has nerve symptoms, particularly if surgery is being contemplated, it's often very helpful and advisable to get an electrodiagnostic study or an EMG first. Now, in this study, the nerves are essentially traced out in order to see where the problem or the problems are. Important, importantly with that, the person that's doing the test has to consider the presence of double crush syndrome. I've seen and my colleagues have seen plenty of EMGs where the doctor saw tarsal tunnel syndrome or a peripheral neuropathy, and then they didn't go on to interrogate the nerves in the lumbosacral spine to see if there was also a pinched nerve in the back because in those instances, clearly the doctor thought that he or she had already found the whole problem with the tarsal tunnel syndrome or the neuropathy or whatever they saw first. And as always, if you don't consider a problem, you won't look for it. And if you don't look for it, you can't find it even when it's right in front of you and that can lead to poor outcomes. Okay, I hope you found this video on leg and foot numbness and tingling useful. Uh, if you've enjoyed it and if you've hopefully learned something, uh, please remember to click the, the like this video button, subscribe to the channel, and please tell a friend who might enjoy it as well because that's the way that we can spread good health information and achieve good health outcomes together. Now, as always, if you have any questions that you would like for me to answer in a future video, uh, if you have any comments, you can reach me at Dr. Cooper at PrincetonSJC.com. Or, of course, feel free to leave me a comment uh, or any comment in the comment section. Thank you very much.